all of the hosts again. Won't you just honor them, love them? They've made it such a great conference. Wow, it has been an absolute blast. How many of you feel like you have been fed up? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I feel like I've just received such incredible impartation over the last uh, 24 hours. And uh, do you know the principle of impartation works like this? You receive in seed form what is already in fruit form in someone's life. And as you cultivate that seed, it grows greater and larger than the person you received it from. It's very powerful. I wonder why am I not seeing the more miracles or the more breakthroughs that the person who laying hands on me sees. Well, you've got to cultivate that. Because you see, with every gift comes a journey. <laughs> with every gift and call comes a journey that God's going to take you on. And trust me, my aim is to release a generation who don't have to make the same mistakes I have to walk through the same journey that I've had to walk through, that they start on my ceiling, but I'm, and so my ceiling becomes their platform. But the reality is until they cultivate what God gives them in seed form, He won't give them much more because they've not been faithful with a little. And so today we can have some impartation. I know tonight we'll do some more impartation uh, with Rob tonight. It's going to be an absolute blast. Get ready. But I want to encourage you, and we're going to do some today as well this afternoon. I want to encourage you that you can only get from us what you cultivate in your heart. That's when harvest breaks through. And so it's been such a joy just being here. I just feel like God has been doing so much um, for us and with us. I know a number of people have been asking for resources from me. Um, I'm, I'm just a newbie on the block. So... Um, I don't have many resources, but I do want to encourage you. My website is up and running. should come up now. There it is. Look at that. Um, if you go to Frequency, notice how it's spelled. Uh, frequent, C, it's a play on words. Speaking about the frequency of heaven, the sounds, and the ability to frequently see into the dynamic of the spirit. And so it's, um, I just go to Frequency. There is a store with some of our teaching. I've got a whole teaching on gaining heaven's perspective, which is um, a, a seven-hour teaching series on coming into the seer realm and the dynamics of heaven. I encourage you to get a download of that. Um, it's also available. Also, I have a teaching on there called Our Ecstatic Union with Christ, teaching on what it means for us to now live in oneness with God. You know that we occupy the same position that Jesus does in Trinitarian intimacy, and that whatever is true of Jesus is now true of us. So if your older brother walked in it and had it, you can walk in it and have it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so I encourage you to get on there. Also on Amazon, I've got my book, Gaining Heaven's Perspective, um, which is a, a real uh, easy read to understanding the prophetic and how to come into more. I, and I'm not just saying this, and I really had to get over this hump. You know when people talk about their product and they go, this product will change your life. Um, I really had to get over that because I was really shy about some of the stuff that I was writing until God said to me, one, I'm giving you the stuff, and two, this is going to bless people, so act like it will bless people. <laughs> so I want to encourage you to grab a download on Amazon or Gain in Heaven's Perspective. Numbers of people who have read it have said to me uh, that it's not only changed their ability to uh, hear from God, but their intimacy levels with God have gone up. And the book was birthed out of a place of intimacy. I had an angelic encounter with God, with the angel of writing. And, uh, and God began to speak to me out of that encounter. And that's why I wrote that book. Um, and so I want to encourage you, you'll see some incredible fruit in your life. It's not just a manual. Um, it, it, is, it is an invitation into encounter. So if you want, grab a hold of it on Amazon. There's both the hard copy and the downloads that you can get. The book is currently in its reprint, which is why I couldn't bring any uh, stock down. So that's really exciting. Um, you know, God is just really good. And I want to quickly um, unpack one or two things around understanding how to live in a perpetual and ongoing glory encounter. Um, I, I, I believe God's inviting the church in this season uh, to come into an encounter with His presence and with His glory that is going to last us until we are caught up in Him. 
you know, that when you look at the history of revival since the book of Acts, you'll notice that the moves of God have begun to get closer and closer together, kind of like a woman who's going into labor as labor pains get closer and closer together the sooner that baby's about to arrive. And when you do a study of revival history, in particular this nation, the moves of God have begun to come closer and closer together. And so I've lived through three moves of God in my lifetime, and I'm only 36 years young, 35 years young. Um, it's very young. And, um, and we've seen God do some amazing things. I lived through the renewal seen God do amazing things in the 80s and the 90s, and then through an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in what was called the Toronto Blessing or the Father's Blessing, and then through Pentecola. And now we're in, I believe, the last move of God, the greatest move that we'll ever see, I believe. Uh, that I, you know, I've stopped praying for revival because I am the revival that the world needs. And I'm walking in that and we're seeing incredible uh, miracle signs and wonders it's easier not to see people get saved. Just read a secular article recently, about three weeks ago. In just under three years, China will have more Christians than communists in the nation. It will be a Christian nation. <clears throat> we are living in days of incredible power. I work. Um, I've got good friends of mine and family of mine who work into closed nations, particularly Muslim world nations, and they're seeing a thousand, thousand Muslims saved a month, and that's just one little ministry. We're seeing God do some amazing things. Contrary to popular belief, the church wins. Yes. The kingdom of God is established. Yes. And uh, I've noticed that in the life of Christians that we still have too many who live in the realm of immaturity where they run from conference to conference, and instead of getting an equipping, they're getting a booster. You see, conferences are good if they equip you to do something. They're bad if you're just getting a quick life booster, because you can't sustain that in the privacy of your own home. You see, the reality is, we have to understand how to create the atmosphere of revival wherever we go. We have to understand how to create an atmosphere where heaven breaks out. And it's easy to come under an atmosphere and walk and live in that atmosphere. It's another thing to create an atmosphere. And so Saul, who's an incredible man, who had some experience of the Spirit, King Saul, he had a sense of the Spirit coming upon him, because the Spirit left him, and he didn't even realize that. But he had a sense of the Spirit come upon him, could live under other people's created atmospheres, but he couldn't create the atmosphere himself. And so when he needs to prophesy, he meets some prophetic people, comes under their atmosphere, and he's able to prophesy like them. But whenever he's alone, whenever he's out of that atmosphere, he can't prophesy. And so when he's tormented, in order for him to get free from that torment, he has to call David in to create an atmosphere in which he can find some peace because he doesn't know how to create it himself because your internal reality and your internal atmosphere is what will create the external atmosphere you live under. And so if your internal reality is one of anxiety and fear, one of, of, of concern and dread, the reality you will live in is that which you confess and possess on the inside. And many Christians live their life from high to high rather than glory to glory. They live from high to low, high to low, high to low, when God's called us to live in a perpetual increase of glory. Your body was designed for glory. <laughs> Your whole dynamic was designed for glory. And I'd love you quickly to turn in the Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to unpack this very quickly because I believe if you get this, you will not only come into an ever-increasing sense of His glory, but you will become the dispensers of His glory because you will learn how to control, and I mean that in the right sense of the word, or let me rephrase it, you'll learn how to create the atmosphere around you so that when others come under that atmosphere, what they experience is the kingdom of God. It's why often when I'm in particular places, particularly in New Age places, people will come up to me and say, I, I don't know what it is about you, but there's this bright 
light. I've never seen such a bright light around anyone. It's because they are perceiving and recognizing the atmosphere I carry in the anointing. And you're supposed to carry that too. And the greater you become aware of what's on the inside of you, and more importantly, who's on the inside of you, the greater you allow the reality of heaven to be, to be dynamically manifested wherever you go. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 says this, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what well, once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is... Freedom. Okay, you've got to say it like the Scots. Okay, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is... Yeah. That was very good. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth, and he's helping shape the apostolic culture in which this church is meant to grow and function. This is a church that is not perfect. Aren't you so glad that the Bible is that honest? It's got sexual immorality and all sorts of rubbishing, but it's got the gifts of the Spirit on display. It's got glory encounters galore. There's something about grace, if we really understand it, that will not only expose our sin, but empower us to overcome our sin. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing, and so often in graceful communities, sin seems to be rampant only because there's an opportunity for God's empowering presence to help that community overcome that sin. And so I love Paul being very honest about the stuff that's going on, and even in his grace he brings discipline to some really difficult situations. Discipline is not punishment. <laughs> punishment is... is, is, is um, giving you the due reward of your sin. Discipline is shaping your affections around God's purposes. Very important, and sometimes shaping your affection, what you do not learn in his favor, he'll allow you to learn through some suffering. Did you get that? I'm not saying God is the author of suffering, I'm not saying that he wants you to suffer, but what I'm saying is that very often because we do not understand and get what he gives us in his favor, sometimes discipline has to shape us in a difficult way. So it could do you good to recognize your season of favor and learn as much as you can in your character in the context of favor, then wait for the place of suffering. I'll move on quickly. And Paul is writing here and he says, the context of your local church, the context of what God does in the kingdom is all found in the person of the Holy Spirit. That he is, he, he is in whom the kingdom is found. And where the kingdom of God breaks out, where the Spirit of God breaks out, there's incredible freedom. And he begins to try and look for an analogy for us to understand the kind of covenant that we've now entered into concerning the person and the Holy Spirit. And the image that comes to his mind is the glory of God found on a mountain called Sinai. And he contrasts this with the glory that is now found in Jesus. You see, Moses lived under an expression of glory that was contained and ruled and governed by the law. The new covenant, the glory, is not contained by a set of rules. It is contained and revealed in a person called Jesus. And so we get to enter into a relationship with the one who is the very glory of God. Huh. That's powerful if you get that. 
And so he's using a contrast of two models of glory. Your body was designed for glory. <laughs> the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, before man sinned, Adam was created in the very image and glory of God. It's why we have the ability to give him glory. Because he put it in us first. Your worship is not a sacrifice in the sense that you're doing something really hard for him. Your worship simply is a response to what he's already given you. Your glory to him is what he's put in you. And it's what makes humanity so valuable. And it's why we call to honor one another despite our performance. Because you're of intrinsic worth because his glory has been put in you. And because of sin, we've become broken image bearers of that glory. And we've fallen short of that glory. But in the new covenant, we get restored to that glory. And indeed, we get the glory better than we've ever had it. Because Adam and Eve had the glory reflected and walking with them in the garden. We now have the glory in us. And he says Moses had this encounter with the glory. I love Moses. Because Moses is this outrageous figure that whilst under the law gets the benefits of God's glory in a way that most Christians have never encountered under the new covenant. There's so much more for us. I had someone complain on one of our, one of our Facebook pages about you know, all this new age stuff connected to the Christian world. And I'm like, have you read the Bible? The supernatural encounters in the Bible make the New Age movement look silly in comparison to how outrageous God can be supernaturally. And Moses has a profound encounter with the glory of God. That is outrageous. It's over the top. There's a mountain called Sinai that is covered with the glory cloud that has lightnings and dark thunderings in. So powerful it is that the people of Israel do not want to go up for themselves, so they want to send a representative to get there. I know many people in the church like that today. We don't want to hear God's voice. Why don't you go hear God's voice for us? Do you know, in society today, if you look into someone else's intimacy, it's called voyeurism. I want to suggest to you, in the church, there's a lot of spiritual voyeurism going on. Where we look into other people's intimacy with God and want the benefit of that without paying the cost of intimacy for ourselves. That was an owie. And said, no, 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 you go up for us, Moses. We'll listen to God once you come back down. And Moses goes right into the cloud and it's lightning and thunder and he hears the voice of God, he encounters God. And what I love about Moses is that he's a cheeky Jew. <laughs> he's right in the, the manifested presence of God. And he says, God, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your glory so that I might have more favor. That's cheeky. He says, I know I got some favor. Give me your glory so I can get some more favor. <laughs> That's called favor behavior. You need to orientate yourself around the favor of God because the same favor that's in Jesus is the same favor that's on you. And Moses comes into this encounter and he has this glory encounter with God. And God hides him in the cleft of the rock and he walks past Moses and Moses sees his back. And when he sees his back, he gets a revelation of goodness of God. Isn't that incredible? Many Christians miss their moments in God because they settle simply for the presence of God. Listen, if I walked into a room right now and you heard my voice or you, um, you felt that I was in the room, how many of you know that you're in the room you can feel someone coming to the room, can't you? You can sense that there's someone else in the room. Most Christians worship long enough to sense his presence. And they go, Greg, we've got the presence. Yay. And we do not continue to wait on his glory. The difference between the presence of God is that it just simply announces his arrival. And the glory of God is that it reveals who he intrinsically is in his goodness. God doesn't just want you to have an encounter with his presence. 
You want to come into an encounter with his glory where you get to see his goodness, where you get to see who he is. Listen, the temple of old, it's incredible. The way the temple worked was that the back or the, the, the front hosted the manifested glory of God. And the priest's job was to keep his back to the congregation until he got into the place of the manifestation of the glory. And only once he had an encounter with the glory did he turn around and serve the people. Most churches do it the other way around. They expect the ministry team to serve them first. When actually as kings and priests we all have a responsibility to get to the glory first before we do anything for him. And Moses has this encounter with the glory of God. The problem is Moses' encounter can only last for a limited amount of time because he's living under a legalistic dispensation. He's living under a legalistic covenant. He's living under rules and regulations. So the glory is depending upon his behavior, not his position. And most Christians have encounters with God have encounters with the glory, and what they do immediately after a conference like this or a moment like this is, right, I'm going to make some radical changes. I'm going to fast every Thursday, and I'm going to wake up at 5 o'clock like Smith Wigglesworth did every morning to break bread. I've done this. See, young man, I remember I was about 15, 16, I just read my first Smith Wigglesworth book. I was like, I was so hungry. It was like fire in my eyes. I'm going to be the next Smith Wigglesworth, only South African. <laughs> and I was getting ready for it. So I figured if Smith Wigglesworth prayed at 5 o'clock in the morning and broke bread, I need to pray 5 o'clock in the morning and break bread. So I did. And the problem was that come 10 o'clock that morning, I was grumpy as can be and not reflecting anything of the Holy Spirit to anybody. The glory didn't even last that long. And many of us, we think that maintaining our encounter with God or creating the atmosphere that we're called to live in comes out of a legalistic pursuit of God when what he's looking for is a relational encounter. Because you see, in the new covenant, something radically transforms in that the person of glory begins to be resident in our life. So the atmosphere we get to reflect, reflect is one that is connected to his glory. And it means now that it's not based on my law keeping, but on my right relating. You see, you can never waste enough time on Jesus. Your relating to him is not based on your ability to stay holy or be holy. Your relating to him is based on his ability to be faithful to the covenant that he cut with his father on the cross so that even in the place of faithlessness, he'll still be faithful to reveal himself to you. And so it's no longer dependent on my emotional state. It's no longer dependent on my willpower. It's no longer dependent on how hard I have to believe. It's simply dependent on the fact that Jesus is the full representation of the glory of God. And where Moses only got to see the back of God, I now get to see the face of God. That's what the new covenant means. And for many of us, we still live in a schizophrenic Christianity that thinks if I work harder, I'll get more. When the Bible says he's given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. This is supposed to make you happy. I mean, I know it's, I know it's, uh, it's nearly happy hour, I'm sure. The reality that you're invited into in this glory realm is not one that is going to be based on how you keep your scorecard. It's one that is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. It means that because he is the very glory of God, every time I connect with who he is, 
Every time I relate to Him, every time I fall in love with Him, every time I spend moments with Him, glory is at work in my life. You see, His goodness is the revelation of His glory. That there's this weight that comes upon you that weighs you down with goodness. Now you find it a little bit hard to walk because you're smothered <laughs> in goodness. You find it a little bit difficult to think because when you're out of your mind, you're in glory and you see something of his goodness. Brothers and sisters, we are called to live a life of glory. And the reason that most moves of God have stopped is because man has put its scaffolding around that move in order to try and contain that move when God wants us to release his move to the earth. You see, when you begin to realize that you are called to live in an ongoing expression of glory, you'll begin to realize that whatever you touch is to come under the reign of that glory. It means you're, you know who's the gatekeeper of your home? You are. Who's the gatekeeper of your work? You are. You determine the reality that you want to live under. The problem is for most of us, we've never understood the power of agreement. What you agree with releases authority for that thing to be at work in your life. Now listen, you need to understand something. That the greatest display of glory that ever happened, happened on the cross. And at the cross, the Bible says that the enemy was stripped of all of his authority. Notice, it doesn't say his power. It says his authority. Power is the ability to act. Authority is the delegated right to influence or act. Can you see the difference? We gave the enemy the delegated right to act and influence on this earth when we sinned. At the cross, Jesus took that back. Is the devil powerful? Absolutely. You don't want to go messing with him. Does the devil have authority to work? Absolutely not. And so the only way the devil can be empowered and the only way the demonic can be empowered is by understanding agreement. And at the cross on a hill called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, the enemy was stripped of his authority. But when you begin to agree with his assumptions and his condemnation and his guilt and his words of condemnation against you, when you begin to allow yourself to, the Bible calls it symphoneo, to make the same sound. So we get the word symphony from. Different sounds making the same sound. When you agree with the enemy and make the same sound as him, he has power then to work the very accusation out in your life. And the greatest place of spiritual warfare that you will face is not on some mountain in Devon. It's not going to be some secret place where there might be some Freemasons. It's going to be in your Golgotha, the place of your skull. And until you apply the cross to the place of your skull, until you begin to see that glory is resident in the cross, you'll agree with the enemy and he'll be empowered to work the very lie that you agree with out in your life. Listen, can I just say something? I believe in inner healing. I really do. I believe in dealing with uh, 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 some, some issues to do with behavioral patterns and family generational stuff that comes down, demonic visitations. But is that in your bloodline? No. Because that's got to do with your identity. Jesus set you free at the cross from receiving anything in your bloodline. And if he disarmed every principality and power of authority, trust me, the day you got that transfusion, in fact, you didn't get a transfusion, you got a whole new bloodline because you were resurrected into newness of life. 
that family thing that you think you have to deal with stopped, what you now need to do is make a consistent agreement with what is true about you, not what was true about you or your family. The cross is big enough to deal with everybody's sin, including your great-grandpappy. And for too many of us, we allow sin to become an identifying issue when the truth is, inside of you dwells the fullness of the Godhead. That you now have become a partaker, one Peter says, of the divine nature. Shika bazooka. It means that the DNA of the glory, the very glory of God in Christ Jesus is flowing in and through you, church. And somebody's got to tell you to mature and some go choose to agree with him. Not my circumstance. Amen, Julian. Good point. Because you're called to live from glory to glory. And if you're to manifest the internal reality of glory around you, you're going to have to consistently choose what's true about you in Christ rather than what the enemy throws at you. Listen, I can't tell you. I've got every excuse in the world not to be up here. I don't have it together. I don't have massive degrees. I don't have, I'm just a little kid from Africa. But I'm so glad that God is not looking for my ability, but my availability. God's just looking for a vessel to fill. You see, the devil and God have the same thing in mind. They want to possess you. Who are you going to be possessed by? And Paul argues that Moses' ability to have an encounter with the glory was limited because of the legalism and the covenant that he was under, which meant he had to do everything to try and get close to God. When under this new covenant, it's the fact that God's come close to us. And because of that fact, we now get to live in an ever-unfolding degree of glory. And I love what this says. It says that we are being changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And the, the, the sense that this word carries is that we get to look into a mirror. And as we look into the mirror, we are being changed from one degree of glory to another into the same image. But have you looked into a mirror lately? Who do you see? You see your face. And I remember thinking, I can't be changed into me. That seems weird. Until I began to understand how Jesus, how the Father sees me. That the reality of the new covenant is that the hope of glory is resident in me. So when I look into the mirror, I do not look or regard myself according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And if glory is on the inside of me, the only thing I get to see out there in that mirror is glory. And to the degree that I allow my mind, my heart, and my affections to be renewed by what I see in the glory of Jesus, it's to the degree that I will walk in that glory. It's not that I need to get more from him, it's simply that I need to be convinced more by him. Oh. You know what the result is? Freedom. Freedom. Now, many Christians talk about freedom to me. They talk about their great freedom. I've been set free, hallelujah. But I want to suggest to you that there's a difference between bondage, captivity, and freedom. Bondage, you're under the rulership of a harsh taskmaster who tells you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Right? The people of Israel were under bondage. In Egypt, they had to do what their taskmaster said. 
Then they get released from Egypt, and they come into the Promised Land. But because of compromise, they come under captivity, and they come into captivity, where another king who is illegitimate rules over them, even though they're allowed to be Jews, even though they're allowed to sacrifice, even though they're allowed to worship and do all the stuff that normal Jewish people do. Problem is. They had to submit to the law of the king that was over them. It's kind of like in South Africa, we have massive game parks, right? They are huge. Lions get to be lions in these game parks. They get to roar. They get to hunt. They get to be lions. But the minute they touch their nose up against the boundary line of that electric fence, they realize they're in captivity. I want to suggest to you that many in the church live their life Number one, never ever get into the boundary because they're too afraid to go there, but not even realizing that they're in captivity. Freedom is the hallmark of an apostolic people who understand the glory of God. And freedom looks like something. Let me just throw this out there and then I'll I'll end when we pray for people. Freedom looks like something. In a freedom culture, let me just do it there quickly. In a freedom culture, your adventure is not based on what you're allowed to do, but on how far you can run. Ha! Do you know God? He's not looking to you to work for him. I stopped working for God about four or five years ago. Because it was tiresome and boring. And I work with him. I get to run wild with him. He's so much fun. He's the funniest person I know. Some of you are like, that's irreligious. How dare you say that? So we'll just quickly kill that religious car and say, God loves to laugh. He's got a sense of humor. He made the person next door to you. He must have a sense of humor. He made me. He must have a sense of humor. When last have you gone on an adventure with God? Where fear has not been the governing factor, but freedom has. That's what freedom looks like. Freedom, (laughs) in a freedom culture, perfection is not the aim. Delight is the aim. (laughs) There's some perfectionists in this room today. God's going to set you free. Because you see, perfection has to do with fear, fear of failure, and fear of losing control. i mighty quiet in this Pentecostal church today. In a freedom culture, the aim is not what you do, but the delight while you're doing it. Listen, at the end of the day, God's not going to go, let's tally up your score and see what you've got. Because he is the prize and we've got him already. I mean, that deserves a highlight flipping Luya right there. You've got, he is the prize. And I love Abraham. He's walking around in the desert. God says to him, Abraham, Abraham, not Abraham at the time, I am your exceeding great reward. And he goes, What are you going to give me? And he missed the point. He is our exceeding great reward. I'm not working for rewards. I've already got the reward. His name is Jesus. In a freedom culture, oh, this is going to hurt somebody, but God bless you. In a freedom culture, policing people's sin is the lowest form of accountability. And the highest form of accountability is calling destiny out of you. We have got so, we've got the church police. 
grumpy religious people. Listen, sin is bad. If you're in sin, stop it. Don't do it. It's not your nature. God's given you a new nature. But listen, God is less interested in your sin and he's more interested in your destiny, which is why he needs you to clean up that sin. But we've got too many people going, so let's just have a little quick check and see how you've done this week. I just need some gossip info. I mean, sorry, I need to know what's really going on. I'll move on quickly. In a freedom culture, position is not based on hierarchy, but it is based on gifting and calling. I, I tell you what, Jesus never, ever despises people concerning greatness. He says, if you want to be great, that's good. He said to John and to James, greatness is not bad, and he doesn't rebuke them. You know, John and James are like, who's going to sit at your right hand or at your left hand? You know, and Jesus says, if you want to be great, you're going to be the least in the kingdom. He never tells John and James off for their desire to be great. Great. He simply redefines it. And for many of us, we think hierarchy or position is what determines the pecking order of greatness. When in a freedom culture, it's who you're called to be operating in your gift, finding your space, finding the place that the puzzle you are fits into. Because without you fitting into that place, the picture is incomplete. And in a freedom culture, greatness means celebrating who we all are because we all carry the glory of God in us. In a freedom culture, it means that I get to be who I am authentically without any fear of shame because who I am is valued not based on what I do, but who I am in Him. Now, before you all say amen, and I've heard a lot of amens, the way you want to be treated is the way you've got to treat others. You see, until we release this freedom culture around us, that means your children, your spouse, are you controlling or freeing? Shika bazooka. You see, in a freedom culture, we get to dance with the Trinity. And not only do we get to dance with the Trinity, but we get to celebrate others who dance with the Trinity. You see, I, I tell you, I am I'm so exhausted of hearing people talk about no one's recognized my ministry. Can I just say to you, if you get on with dancing, somebody's going to see you on the dance floor. Don't worry. But the most important thing you need to realize is you're dancing with the King of Kings. You see, the internal freedom that you will live with is the external freedom you will express. In a freedom culture... Authority does not look like lording it over someone by releasing someone. In a freedom culture, authority does not look like lording it over someone by releasing people. My whole life, the spiritual authority that God has given me is not given to me in order to govern you in such a way that I lord over you, but it's in order to give to you that you might be released into the kingdom. Do you know the difference between wheat and tares? Do you know why God allows them to grow up together? It's because not only in the design of the kingdom is it good for you to grow up next to the people who are going to challenge you and be a bit of a grace sandpaper against you, but he allows tears to grow up because you can only see the difference 
once they've grown up. Because weak and cares are different. A care, when it is fully grown, stands up tall and proud with an empty head void of any reproductive seeds. Weak is bowed low with full head of reproductive seeds. The key to understand what it means to be in the kingdom is not about the position of where you are, but the posture. Your posture determines how fruitful you'll be. Brothers and sisters, freedom means that you get to enjoy all that God has for you. Just one or two more and I'm going to end. Listen. In a freedom culture, daddy's house has no bonds. You've got an all-access card and you get to draw on the walls. <laughs> Do you know that you're unpunishable? Oh, we just hit a holy car right there. I can hear it moving. Is there consequence for your sin? Absolutely. Listen, if you sin, you can have some consequence. So please don't sin. But are you going to get punished? Because Jesus paid for every sin you'll ever commit, past, present, or future. And when you understand that, it's not going to drive you to want to sin more. It's going to drive you to want to enjoy Him more. And the reality is, He says, in my Father's house are many rooms, so where I am, you may be also. And He's not talking about the day you die. Somebody once said, this is not just pie in the sky for the sweet by and by until the day we die. This is steak on the plate while we wait. <laughs> we get to enjoy heaven now and we get to explore the heavenly rooms now. Not when I die. Who wants to go to heaven when they die and only wait for a day when the inheritance has already been given to us? Freedom means I get to explore places in heaven without any restraint. And then lastly, freedom means I live in a constant state of childlike wonder. Listen, if your quiet times are boring, stop having them. <laughs> I give you permission, stop, because it's just legalism then. I know people who breathe a sigh of relief. They've done their 10 minutes, like exercise. I've done my 10 minutes, I can go now. Brothers and sisters, that's just legalism. Why would you want to live in legalistic expression when I get to walk with him, I get to talk with him? doesn't matter where I am. People think I'm crazy in saying spirits. I don't care. Why? Because I'm talking to the one that I love. If it doesn't cause, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, reading the Bible and missing the point completely. Because I was looking for another sermon to preach that would make me sound good. And I missed the fact that he wanted to speak to me. I remember praying for more anointing. Because I thought, if I get more anointing, I can do more powerful stuff. But actually, the anointing sets you apart for him. Not for service. I remember reading those books on five steps and becoming a more powerful Christian. Fifteen steps and getting your financial breakthrough. As if all of those steps is what gets us the breakthrough when actually it's the relationship. Some of the steps are good. But if they don't flow from relationship, it's a fading glory. If you want to sustain your encounter with God, create that in the place of your home and create that externally, you've got to live in the realm of glory that's not governed by rules, regulations, or function, but comes out of the overflow of a freedom and a relationship with the one that you love. And so I know some of you are waiting for five steps on how to create the reality externally. <laughs> But all you do is make another legalistic ritual and formula out of that. 
So I'm going to leave it like this. If you want to create an atmosphere in your home that is reflective of what's in your heart, waste time on him. Love him, worship him, waste time on him. Because out of the overflow of your time with him and your intimacy with him, glory is revealed in you. Because what you behold, you become like. Too many people behold the old, sinful, stinky nature that's dead. And they wonder why they struggle with sin. By the way, Talking to your old dead self is necromancy. That's a sin. <laughs> Don't go digging that old fleshly corpse up. It's dead and buried. You've got a new nature now. What are you beholding? Who are you beholding? When you behold him, everything changes. Father, thank you for your goodness. Come, Holy Spirit. Can I take 15, 20 minutes just to minister? I think I might minister prophetically if that's all right. If we're done by half past four, is that okay? Fantastic. I, I know God also wants to touch some people because there are numbers of you who are still living under the curse of control. You see, control operates as a mechanism even beyond the person who's trying to control you. Because it gets into your mind, so every decision you make, you filter it through what that person is going to do or say. And so you're never free to make your own decisions. And in numbers of you, some of you have even got parents who've passed away, and still you're making decisions according to what they say. And you're afraid to walk in freedom. Go on to bring some freedom to many of you. So the sunset's free is free indeed. Come Holy Spirit.